Dr. Paul, let's, let's turn our attention to kind of systemic therapy. Um, patient walks into your office, they have metastatic disease, um, you have to determine kind of their prognostic variables based upon uh, their clinical parameters. You're going to have a conversation with them about targeted therapy. So, so give us an example of what goes through your head and how you then explain that to the patient about how you decide what's the approach that's right for them, how you choose in a general sense what the agent is, and then how you present that to the, the potential patient and the family. Sure, sure, and I, I trained under you, so I feel like I have really learned from the best here. I, I really approach the patient with two underlying goals, and the first is to potentially maximize their survival, but hand in hand with that, I'd also like to maximize their quality of life. My personal belief is that that very oftentimes entails participation in clinical trials. One of the challenges with the therapeutic state that we're in right now with renal cell is that although we have seven FDA-approved targeted agents, we really only have two categories mechanistically of drugs, VEGF inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors. Uh, with clinical trials at our disposal, we oftentimes expand beyond that. We'll be talking soon about clinical trials of PD-1 inhibitors, MET inhibitors, and so on. And I often find that the toxicity profiles of those agents can be acceptable, if not better, than some of the existing drugs that are currently at our disposal. In terms of establishing prognosis, um, I don't think that that's evolved markedly over the years. Uh, previously, we would apply the Mozart criteria or MSKCC criteria in the context of patients receiving immunotherapy. Uh, in the context of targeted therapy, those have now morphed into the HANG or IMDC criteria. Uh, those are certainly helpful in risk stratifying patients into good, intermediate, or poor risk cohorts on the basis of factors such as their baseline hemoglobin, uh, performance status, and so on. Um, and, and certainly that may play a role in treatment allocation as well. But do you, do you find, for example, that uh, although approaching the patient may be similar, your expectations in terms of benefit will be different based upon different prognostic variables that the patient presents? And then you can have a, a kind of a sense of what to expect in terms of the value of the therapy in that patient. So you're already making a judgment about how well they'll do or not do independent of the toxicity? That's a great point, and I, I certainly think that now that these prognostic factors have been vetted in the context of targeted therapies, we can do so in a much more precise fashion. So, Dr. George, patients in front of you, previously untreated, metastatic disease, good or intermediate prognosis, or occasionally poor prognosis, um, how do you choose your first-line therapy? So, um, I, I try to stick to the evidence and uh, um, based on the um, large phase three trials that we have. Um, a majority of the patients who were enrolled in the sunitinib versus interferon trials were uh, good or intermediate risk group, and so was uh, uh, the pesopinib uh, trial, and so was the bevacizumab interferon uh, trial. So um, those are the um, first best choices, um, but um, bevacizumab interferon is not uh, used as much as the TKIs because of the ease of use and uh, need to come back to clinic for infusions and, and, and also the need for multiple injections. Um, so sunitinib or um, um, pesopinib are, are the first choices in that setting uh, for uh, intermediate or good risk group. But for poor risk patients, um, I try to use either uh, tempsorolimus or, or sunitinib as the, as the first uh, dose, as first uh, drug to start.